And here we go. Welcome to True House Stories. I am yeah. Lemmy Fontana for a special weekend edition. I broke the news a week and a half ago. I pulled him aside. I said, yo, bro, I need you on the show, baby. He said, let's do it. So here's a guy that's a house gangster. I'm not talking mafioso. I'm talking house original gangster. When they used to wear their hats to the side, there was, there was Armand and all these guys that, you know, they had that sound. It was rough. You know, where you got Frankie Knuckles with the beautiful sound, now you got the gangster sound, more the darker sound, more the banging disco beats, rougher, tougher, stronger, harder, longer. He even had success working with Daft Punk, which is pretty freaking amazing. And Daft Punk, you know, they're pretty well respected, overground and underground, all right? The boy hails from Chicago, he's a Puerto Rican brother. It's like, you know, when they say, oh, yeah, Sosa, where the yayo, man? This is where we go to for the yayo. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, it's like in the movie Scarface. I never crossed you, Sosa. I never crossed you. <laughs> never crossed me. Man. I never crossed you. So I'd like to welcome one of our brothers from the house music scene. He ran a record label store. He was part of the record industry for a long time. Before he became the big DJ, you all know him. He actually sold records to all the guys. And he was part of retail. He was part of it all. And that's on the real. He's done a lot of remixes, a lot of productions. The man is well-respected. Can be controversial at times, but that's what makes him who he is. And on that note, we all like to welcome from True House Stories, a special weekend edition with my man, DJ Sneak. Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah. Where the dogs loose. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, doing, so thank you, brother, for doing this. Yeah. I appreciate, you know, there's a lot that's going on. But before we get into the controversy, controversial parts of what you're going to discuss, we do this with everyone. And I'm the first question I have to ask. You know, the young Sosa, the young kid, how does music find you, brother? Where does it find you? Where, you know, like you're in grade school. What was your initial thing? What was the landscape? Give us a kind of division of your, your eyes, what was going on. Well, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. What town? And, and Arecibo. Oh, wow. The big, the big uh, uh, the, what do you call it? They just took that shit down. Anyway, I was born, raised there, and around 13 years old, my, my parents decided to go to Chicago. Most Puerto Ricans go to New York, but we decided to go to Chicago. Moved there, never seen snow, never seen big city, whatever. End up in school, get to the system. And in the first, I would say, week and a half, of me being there and being snowed in in Chicago, not speaking even English, the only thing I went to was the radio, man. And Chicago radio had a lot of great, amazing music, including a lot of mix shows by the original pioneers of Chicago house there. Farley Jackmaster Funk, Steve Hurley, all these guys were on the radio. The Hot Mix Five, Rafi Rosario, who's one of my favorites, man. Like, I, I saw Rafi as like, wow, he's a Puerto Rican guy do, doing this shit and being a DJ too, making music, you know? Um, that's how I found it. I found it on the radio first. And then as you, you know, go through school, I did eight, then I went to high school, and then in high school, everybody was, you know, I was a graffiti writer too. I became a graffiti writer. I used to draw and stuff, but then I got into graffiti and then through graffiti, you found music. And first time I saw a DJ was at a school dance. <laughs> and uh, and I sat there like a little dummy, just asking them questions. Like, how do you do this? What are you doing there? Because I had been recording tapes and trying to figure out how music went from one end to another 55 minutes before the five minutes commercial flip over to the next DJ. And he explained it, man. And after that, I was caught. I was caught. I started buying records before I even had turntables. Wow. 
so that was you say the high school dance then at a, at a, yeah i used to go to roberto clemente community academy right on division in western i lived like a block away from that high school man and it was had eight floors it was really modern high school it could hold up to eight thousand kids in Jesus high school. Christ, that's a big school bro it had escalators in between floors you know what i mean like it yeah was, it's like, like a department store of, of high school yeah i mean it was ghetto and shit because we were in the ghetto but it was it was very modern compared to the old high schools because they were all just old institutions you know old high schools and shit, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, there, man, we, if this, if this, if the baseball team won, they would do a school dance. If the, if the football team won and some sort of city shit, we would do a school dance. So then that's how I got to see what a DJ was and experience wow. music, man. Cause no. I didn't know, I, I only knew Sasa Merengue and old shit. You know what I mean? I never heard house music until I got to Chicago, man. Yeah, being from Puerto Rico, I would think you'd be well, even Charanga by that point. Yeah, well, Charanga would still be hot at, in in Puerto Rico, but not really. It's that was old. Yeah, I was born in nineteen seventy, and from seventy to eighty, Fania All Stars, bro. Fania. I lived that. I lived that life forever. I can I can play every song from it. You know what I mean? And then you know, Chicago brought everything: disco, house, electro. Uh, breakdancing music, whatever, you know? Like, that's why I learned music. So you know, so here's the question. Do you have any musical training instrument-wise? No. I played, a, I played a little bit of uh, clarinet in high school. Okay. Just to but pass a class. Have, you used to just to do it for the class, right? Just for the class, just for the credit. <laughs> I wasn't that good at it, but I was really good with beats always and things like that. I was really on, a, on it. You know, with with stuff, and I mean, house music really just drew my attention, and I just I drank the juice that is still with me today. Oh wow! Yes, I don't know. That's it, bro. You know. So wait, stuff. wait. So you should have been a drummer then, if you're a beats guy. Well, that's when my drums are popping on my tracks, bro. I mean, that's one of my trademarks. It's okay. Like the right. beats, you know what I mean, like. And a, a combination of electronic with Latin beats, you know. I learned that from Rafi's 606 and 626 era. You know what I mean? From my other homeboy, uh, Rico Pizarro. Remember Pizarro? Yeah. He he was he had two 606 and 626 by Roland, and man, he used all those Latin drums and his shit. It was amazing. Man. You can make house music beautiful. Bro. Okay, so here we go. Where does this begin for you as far as DJing? Does it, is it the DJ that becomes first? Or do you get the job in the store first? Like you gotta give us, walk us down. You know, high school ends, where are you going? I mean, I before, by 16, I was already DJing block parties, house parties, church parties, high school parties. <laughs> wait a minute, wait, wait, you, wait, you in a suit doing a wedding too? Uh, that came a little bit later. Okay. That came a little bit later. Did you that imagine everybody like, sneak with knowing that how he dresses wearing a suit coming to your wedding? Uh, I, I would I would do the, the long button up shirt. That was about it, man. I couldn't wear no suit. You had no monkey <laughs> suit on, bro. You couldn't put the suit on with the suit. It was great. Most of the weddings I was playing was Mexican weddings and Latin weddings. So it was all very casual, you know what I'm saying? So it was cool. Anyway, it was that, you know, it was a Start from the ground up. That's you the know? way to do it, though. You have to start yeah. somewhere. You can't I only do one way. That was the way it was like, yo, get one turntable and mix it another turntable, a couple of speakers and an amp, and you're, you're on. You know what I mean? And that was the movement for years. That gave me training to later on in my 20s or whatever, get into wedding, wedding DJ. Because I, I, I started working at record stores, too, small ones around Chicago until I got to the hip house, which I worked at four and a half years. People just knew me as Carlos from the hip house. I'm also a graffiti writer and an airbrush artist. So I was painting t-shirts for people the whole time I was there. That was my side money. I would airbrush DJ's names and 
hearts with shit, you know, like that. That's who I was too, man, for years. That was more training, you know, but through that, I learned the retail business. I sold the first bad boy bill mixtapes there were, you know what I mean? I saw the birth of a lot of things that, that mattered to an industry that was growing. Not just vinyl, man. Well, oh, you know, lot. people don't realize that with all of us. They don't realize that there's a there was a thing before you became the man sneak, the DJ that people saw you traveling. There's a whole story that happened pre to yeah. all that. Yeah, I mean, I had I have I had passion, and through passion, I got to DJing when people said, "There's a million DJs. Why are you gonna make it?" You know what I mean? It's very competitive in Chicago. And plus, at the time I grew up, it was gangs, too. So you had to deal with that shit, too. So, was, so what do you mean gangs? In the sense of competing gangs in, in the music side or gangs on the street? Both, man. Both. Both. There was the gangs in the street. But sometimes, I mean, not sometimes. I used to play a place called Centrum Hall in fucking on Ashland and whatever. It was 45 minutes and 50 bucks and a dime bag of weed, bro. <laughs> That's what I play for. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. That's it, a 45 minutes set. That's it. The next DJ was waiting with his records already fucking lined up, yo. And the biggest DJ at that time was Bad Boy Bill. Right. You know, he was like the radio guy that was doing five, six parties in the city, play one hour, go to the next location, play another hour, like that. He would do that all night. So anyway. That keeps going that, you know, working in record stores and with retail gave me the knowledge of who I needed to contact if I, when I wanted to do a label, because I was like, I, you know, I got into making music. Then after searching for people to put out and people are like, yeah, you know, it's cool. I decided, well, I can just print my own record. And I did the fine records. Number what, one. Was the first, what was the first, what was the first, what was that first record you printed? And made. It was the first label I made called Defiant Records, and it was in 1990, and it was called Sneaky Tracks. And it had two tracks, and it has story too. I I made it at home. I mixed it down at Bad Boy Bill Studio. He liked it. We cut a, an acetate. He played it one month before I received the records. I got like test press, and then I gave him a couple. He played it the whole month, maybe five weeks before I got the actual physical. Right. And I drove around Chicago and all the flea markets and all the stores and I sold 1,500 copies in one weekend, bro. From, the, from your car? Pay on the lid, so you did what they call the POD. Open the trunk, you want 50 pieces? Give me this amount of money, right? That's it. Or, oh, you, know, you don't it, realize, it, you don't know Right. Here's an invoice. I'll be back next week to collect because I know you're gonna sell out. And then they would take 30 copies, 50 copies. Some people were generous. Some people knew me as Carlos from the hip house who sold records and music. And I was very good at it, man. So all the stores respected me as a salesperson and somebody that there was competition, but we called each other and we said, hey, you know this fucking record is blah blah blah. Here, man, here's the number. Or, or I got it from this distributor. Go to them; they have it. Yeah, back in the day, I just wanted that. But, you know, uh, ultimately, the person they care about the music and the sales and all that shit too. They wanted that information, so you share that shit, man. So I earned respect for, on that level. I used to go to Barney's Distribution in Chicago, pick up all the dance mania shit. I used to travel because this store was on the northwest side, almost a suburb. And I would go to the hood to pick up Dance Mania records. And my Chevy beat up, Chevy Nova hatchback. I would leave my windows open. It had no stereo. There was nothing to steal on that shit. Just pull <laughs> take, it up. Take it. Put the records in the back. Psh, drive back to the fucking store, you know. So I did a lot of that shit, man. I have a lot of retail experience. And through that shit, I built a lot of love and passion through it, man. I've been through a lot of the first things that made a difference in this industry that we call house music. Then it became something else, which you'll get to later. Yeah, but we'll talk about that later. But we gotta get 
You got to yeah. paint the picture. You got to paint the picture. If you don't paint this picture, nobody will understand why you're saying what you're saying. And I need you to paint the picture clearly and what your background yeah. is. You so know? Check it. At that four year stint, one of the people that I worked for straight up told me to my face that I would never be shit and I was challenged. And I was like, cool, you know what? I quit. I'll see you later. By then, I had my music equipment. And that whole summer, all I did was party, do drugs like ecstasy and fucking weed, mushrooms, nothing past that. Not gonna lie. And made tracks every fucking day, man. Every day I was on it, like church. I wake up 10 o'clock to seven or eight o'clock till my mom finished cooking food. I could smell the rice and beans and I'd be like, yes, time to go eat, <laughs> get some more weed, head out, be out the whole night. Like I was wilding out because I was, you know, I happened to be single at that time and and I was growing and I was in my twenties, but I was going to parties, meeting people, making bond with people like Derek Carter and Mark Farina and people that like, you know, made a lot of, uh, influence in my my DJ career, man, and uh, and I built from there. You know, I ended up at Gramophone Records as a part time, just so I can pick up my record still and get a good price and shit. But I love that store too. I had a lot of respect for Gramophone. I went there and uh, I worked maybe three two years before my career really took off, because all the tracks that I had been doing that summer, slowly were being dished out, large records. Casual, really. Casual really was the one that opened the door. Casual really, yeah. Cashmere, yeah, right? After that, I got like a bunch of people. Even Glad when Gladys called me from Strictly, I was like, my mom said, there's some lady, there's some lady, her name is Gladys. She's calling you from a label. And I pick up the phone, I was like, Gladys, Gladys Pissar. And I was like, Shitting my pants, bro. I was like, wow. you see, but people don't understand that how incredible that phone call is. They yeah. don't get it. How amazing that phone call is when yeah, a big new was, label calls you. It's like, whoa. And that came after I had met Kenny and Louie at Gramophone. They were in town. And I met Johnny and uh I, it was Johnny and Kenny actually. Johnny D Johnny D from Henry Street. And I was, from was like, I was like, dude, I showed him his section of Henry Street in the store. All right. I was like, this is my side right here. I said, you know how many Armand Van Helden, uh, what is it, uh, old school junkie records I sold? Or how many of these? And he's like, really? I was like, dude, 100 copies on the weekend sometimes. So then I was a good salesperson, man. I didn't mess around. I, I can sell records, bro. And, you know, I was like, you know, I got tracks. Can I send you some shit? I send him a dat with some demos like a week later, man. And he signed my shit on Henry Street. And that record opened a lot more doors, including... Now, which record that, doors. So what was the record that Johnny D signed? It was a polyester EP. Show Me The Way was the track. Uh, it had five tracks, and uh, or four tracks, actually. All disco house stuff. You know, I was doing kind of relief records, which is like ghetto banging house, Chicago booty shit. And then I started doing more disco house uh, influenced by Todd and a lot of New York guys, Tommy Musto, fucking No Ricardo, Mike Delgado, all these guys had influence, you know what I mean? So I, I sold so many other records to the store that I felt like I knew Todd Terry before I met Todd. Right. When I met Todd, I was like, wow. Holy shit, there he is. <laughs> but I had sold like hundreds of his records, man. Same with Armand. We started hanging out. And shit, when he dropped Witch Doctor, I got into trouble because I ordered 150 copies from Strictly. And the story's like, we never order 150 copies of a record. <laughs> and I told my boss, Joe, I said, oh my word. I will have every person buying this record this weekend. Four or five days later, I sold all of them, dude. That's that's called, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I, I, I was a graffiti writer. I had the little 
cards with the graffiti and the name and the fucking price of shit. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. like, I push, I push. I, I understood music in another level, man. Right. And the respect for it is what's keeping me going. This is why I fight so much because I have pride. Hey, you know what? If I went black and white, something's going on my camera, but we're okay. Um, yeah. You know, that's I, we know that. That's why, that's why you needed to to tell everyone the you know the background story because you know people by the way judge on what they read and the bullshit they don't they don't really see it for what it truly is at times you know and hey man, you know, you know, the, the, you know wait, let me explain something before you say you imagine a record shop never taking 150 pieces they must have freaked out i know vinyl mania charlie grapone would have freaked out with 150 yeah. copies we'd be like yeah. And what happens now if we get stuck with this? You know, I got a better story than that one too. When I, I worked, at the, when I worked at the hip house a year before, a lot, um, follow me came out. I got the strictly promo. I loved it. I was like, this shit is gonna be a hit. I call that shit out. I ordered forty copies of that record. <laughs> I did maybe, ah, shit. I would say a year later, man, I have done three inventory runs. And every time I counted, there would be 38 copies in the bin. And my boss was like, dude, you need to send this shit back before we can get return money from this. Right, nobody wants to get stuck with stuff. And I was like, but this record's the bomb. It's just, nobody's listening to it. And then, you know, I, I was hanging with Bill a lot. And sometimes I would bring records to Bill at his, at his house when he was making his mixes with B96 for the radio. I had played this record to Bill 10 times, bro. Okay? But this one night, he heard it. He played it. And I swear to God, the next day, kids ran to the store with cassette tapes. <laughs> I won this song. And what happened? All 38 copies were gone just like that, bro. The power of the DJ. I've said it before. Oh, I've yeah. said this on past shows. Tony Humphrey's playing your record 98.7 Kiss. People come in with the cassettes to bar the Manny Lehman in New York. What's this record? Nobody knows. I know that. We know that feeling. Yo, Ralphie doing the same thing on B96 or Farley. Yeah. Known for that. They would be running a record. Not out yet. Can't get it. Where, what is this? We know what it is. Yeah. Yo, they used to put signs in store. Don't ask us for this record. <laughs> I remember unless you have, unless you have some, store, unless you have a bootleg, then we can talk. You know right. what I mean? Unless you got a booty. Yeah, right, unless you got a booty. We, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's it, man. I mean, you know, that's the truth about my upbringing in this shit. It's like, I, I started from from the bottom. And it's the only way I, to start. Yeah, man. <laughs> you know, no, but the, even this week I posted, you know, I posted what made me the person and the DJ versus what made them, which is social media. Right. The Instagram, the, when it started with MySpace and it went to all the other crap onto TikTok. But wait, 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 we're gonna get there. Let's go on, because we haven't gotten to the pl- you taking your first flight to Europe yet. Wait, we're still yeah. talking about you working near Bill and being an influence yeah. on Bad Boy. So take us on the journey. Go ahead. So Strictly Calls, you signed the record. I, I fly to New York to meet Gladys at Strictly Office. I meet Barry, Gladys, everybody. I was so Barry G, right? Barry G? Yeah. I was so impressed by the office, by the guest, by the... Everything, man. I was like, this is a damn amazing record label. I was so impressed. You know, I was like, that's where I want to be someday. I put that mark up there. Mm -hmm. And and after, you know, chopping it up with Gladys and we chose some stuff and took me to see Mark in his corner office. (laughs) And that was interesting. But we we had something in common. We both smoked weed. And at five o'clock, that man would time out. 
Top pull up his little <laughs> drawer. Put up his little drawer. His shit would be pre-rolled. And I'm talking about. To that point, I never knew about white boy weed. All right. This shit was white boy weed. This shit was properly bomb, yo. So we smoked the fucking joint in the office at five o'clock. And I was like, I love this shit. I was really touched by that shit, man. You know, that's, those are real moments that people, some people will never have. And that's fine. I don't want them to, I don't want to have to explain that shit. But I you went can't to explain that. that. That's a feeling you have at the moment. You know, what I said the other day about like, when you show up to a club and you give in that resident DJ who's your homie a test press of your shit and he sees you and at the right moment he drops your shit and the crowd goes fucking crazy. That was my Instagram moment. That was my TikTok. Right, nobody. Yeah, right, this is all. Be, this is all before internet was even. You had a website. Forget about even yeah. social media. Keep going. Yeah. So strictly, you know I mean? that's yeah. So strictly opens a lot more doors, and then Europe starts knocking, and I start signing records with a lot of German labels and all kinds of stuff. I mean, through I kind of skipped a bit. You know, my first international gig was actually Mexico City. My second biggest international gig was Tokyo, Japan. So I went from Mexico like six, seven months before that, 800 bucks to Japan, Shibuya, Tokyo, standing, flipping out, going, how the hell did I make it here? Like, am I tripping? Or am I standing in this corner with like 2,000 other Japanese people that look at me like I'm Godzilla and shit? You know what I mean? Because I was different. That moment there, co-signed my fucking career and said from now on all you got to do is make this music and dj and that's it you don't have to work for nobody else you know so that gave me the the green light like i for me it was opportunity but i was ready i had been training through years to get to the opportunity and when the shit showed up i was like yeah i'm gonna bet on myself oh, hell yeah i can do this shit you know when you know you're good if you're a good chef and you know you can fucking cook it and like show off, you're gonna have that confidence. I was there, man. I was there at a young age without you were ready. Shit. You were ready, bro. I remember how young you were. You were ready yeah. and you were ready to go. I had hair, I had my mustache. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever. You know, I was just experiencing everything fresh and new. Everything was a new experience, man. So it's like that's the shit that. Those are the moments that kept me pushing forward. Keep going, keep going. And I and I had a good career, man, doing whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I took awesome gigs. I played Ministry of Sound when they opened. I played Cream when they opened. I played clubs when they were like at the heyday. And I would show up. I mean, dude, first time Ministry of Sound, Cyril. What year was that? What was the year that brought, they brought you Ministry, you remember? That would be 94. Yeah, Justin Berkman was the uh, resident still. Harvey was the side door. Small yeah, room. Harvey was playing side resident, right. In the, Harvey, in, man. So well, that's when I like, rolled through there. And to see big names in the big room, I was like, wow. And then like 10 years later, I was handling that room myself. Just just being the most raw sneak you can be, bro. Like no holding back. This is vinyl days too, you know what I mean? This is when, when shit was due. That first, sorry, the ministry shit, not, not shortly after the first time, I went the second time with fucking Cashmere, Boo Williams, Spencer Kinsey, Gene Ferris. I don't know if maybe Glenn Underground was there too. We all went to London to do a relief night at Ministry of Sound. And I saw the first time Cashmere put on a wig, green shit, and did his green velvet live. I saw his first live, bro. You know what did I mean? He you, he, he is, did he tell you guys he was going to do that? Or was just... Yeah, we knew because the preacher, man. But we didn't know he was actually going costume. 
he walked around London that day. We all went shopping and whatever, you know what I mean? And he he had a wig. He had like a, you know, kind of like a little bit of clown wig, fluorescent shit, you know, whatever. But he made a look and he had his glasses. He's like, green velvet. That's what it is, bro. That's wow. a good moment. You know what I'm saying? Those moments I have in my heart, bro. You don't forget that. I don't care how old you are. You never forget stuff like that. I know some people think I'm going crazy and whatever, but I'm saying my cup is so full of amazing things like that that I didn't, I, I didn't even remember those things until what's happened to me recently. Which Good. So keep going. We're gonna. I want to hear more. See, this yeah. is this is documented. People want to hear all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I played London. I played everywhere in Europe and started doing doing the circles. The the DJ that opened doors for me was Derek Carter. And sometimes we he's a bad and he's a bad, badass DJ. He was he's a bad DJ from Chicago that like, you know, broke in Europe and and if he played your if he played the club, most likely you can play that gig a month later after he was there. You know what I mean? So he mm -hmm. opened a lot of doors for me and shit. And we we smashed all over Europe, man. And that's those were the heydays of like, you know, 98, you can't hide from your butt comes out on classic, which is Derek's label. Right. That that put a moment and and underground and 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 who I was as a producer, even though I've done many tracks by then. So that made you a household name, Papa. That made yeah. record made you like took you from okay, that's sneak to oh, that's sneak. Yeah. That's yeah, but see, the shit was though that I got that in '95 when I went when I signed with Strictly Shit. I also went that night. We went to Sound Factory Bar to see Louis, right? And it was our mom, me, Junior, Todd. Like there was a group. Disciple, Dove, like all the underground, Benji. I mean, it was like, you know, Louis. I was there. I was there that night. I know exactly when you came. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go every Wednesday. I would go see yeah. them all. I remember. I, you know, from Chicago, I didn't know that shit. And I, I thought it was like the, the most elite shit I've ever seen. Underground elite hanging out. You know? Right. And mm -hmm. Louis had gotten a copy of Show Me the Way. Woo. And in about an eight hour set, he dropped it. Five or six times that night. <laughs> you want to make a statement on your record, right? I mean, you know, when he loved some shit, he really and he played disco erotica the other one on casual too. He knew I was there. And that's that respect. Oh, homies here from Chicago. Let's give him some love. But five times, bro, <laughs> I was so geeked out. I was like, oh my God, Louis Vegas playing my shit right now. I was like, wow. <laughs> You know, that feeling, man, is like so amazing, man. I told Louie that on the, on, the, on the True House Story show. I said, you don't understand. I, maybe you do know I told him. But I said, you broke a lot of people's, made a lot of people's careers happen because of you playing a record that was not signed yet or just starting. And all of a sudden, all of New York is on the record. And then not too far after, all the UK is all over the record. Because how, you can't be showing records. On records. That's how records were built before social media. That's how records were built before the internet. We we were playing from reel to reel to tape to acetate and test press white label shit. Have that chance to like, you know, build it up. So then when that record dropped, everybody went and bought it. That was their promo. That was our promo, dude. It was our bond and word that we had for this fucking music, man. What? What do you mean bond and word? Explain that. See, they don't get that. What we mean when we say it's our bond and it's our word. You have to really clarify what that means. Okay, I'm 50. I don't know how old most people are here. <laughs> back, yeah. back in the hood, okay? You could be broke, you could be whatever in your lowest shit, but if your word was bond, people would help you people will support you because you were a man of your word. If you said, I'm going to do this shit, you would do it. If I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do my best for you. Not just do it because, oh, I owe you a favor. No, man, 
I'll give you a hundred percent sneak every time. You know, I did that shit with labels. I did that shit with producers. I did that with promoters, everything, man. Like I gave them all. Cause I was like, you know what? You're trying, you believe in me. Let's build something. Let's do a night together or whatever. I'm going to be right. the rest of them and build something together. And what happens if you didn't stay to your word in the hood? You know, because people do that now. You know, everybody, we even have a, we even have people at the top of their level that tell you they're going to do something for you and they don't even come through. What happens back then when you didn't stay? Then that, then that so-called respect is just empty, man. There's no respect. You get no love. You get no love. And actually, when you start falling, people will kick you for being an asshole and shit. You know what I mean? Because people do it all the fucking time. It's real talk. Grown man shit. There's a code. There's ethics. There's things that, you know, you have to have passion for. And if you don't have that passion for it, then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, that's been my shit. I came from zero. I put my life to it. I did devoted my life to it, I said, I'm going to do this shit until I die. Okay. And I'm going to give it 100%. Yeah, and you have. Now, here's the thing. You're living a large lifestyle. I'm not going to say you're you Hefner, but I'm going to say, you know, you're traveling the world. Yeah. Your dream has come true. Yeah. Like a lot of us felt. Like we didn't never dream that we would ever do this like this. Okay. Travel, DJ, remix, everything. Make records, hang. Yeah. To get, we used to laugh. To get paid to do what we loved anyway. Right or wrong? Right. When did it drop off for you? Like, or when did you say to yourself, shit, I don't like this where this is going. Before this episode, we're talking about EDM stars. Because I know for me, yeah. 2006, I saw the writing on the wall. And it was a real hard pill to accept that things were changing. Yeah. So what happened with you in your life, on your road? Honestly, I mean, I kept rolling. And 2001 changed things. After the World Trade Center thing, that changed things. That, that actually cleared a lot of the, the people who were in it for the wrong reasons. And I left a big group of people who said, no, we're still solid. We're going to continue on and do what we got to do. Um, around 2006, seven, the birth, this bastard birth of fucking electro shit, electro came in. <laughs> I know. And I was like, I was like, you know, I, when I say electro, I think Detroit, Juan Atkins electro. You know, Miami bass electro, not the shit that came out in Arthur Baker electro. Exactly. Arthur Baker. All, Breakers course, Revenge. Yeah. All those were John, John Robbie. 100%. All that. A hundred percent. You know what I mean? That's real stuff. Not this other stuff that was like, it, it was made disposable. It was made disposable. It sounded disposable. It, it blew up and made people money and careers that just for having one hit of some noisy ass shit. Anyway, at those times I, I pulled back and I was like, nah, you know what? I'm not down with that shit. I, I made a deal with NRK and I put out banging, um, back in the box, which is, a, a, you know, back when you did mix CDs and compilations, which a lot of people probably don't even know about. But anyway, when you bought shit physical and you bought CDs, mix CDs, I did one. And uh, what it was, it was, I chose 40 of my signature sound records that define DJ Sneak and, you know, what I liked. It's supposed to be one mix, they made it two. I just mixed a whole thing and it was, and it was live and they just chopped in the middle and made two mix CDs. And then they put two CDs with all the tracks that I'd chosen which gave a lot of people uh, a light onto, on, onto, uh, on, a, on a certain style of music that they probably, you know, skipped or didn't get or whatever. You know, I mean, while everybody's on the electro shit, there was this other shit happening. And it was on the underground, like always. We always figure out a way to maneuver our ways. And even though I was in the mainstream market with the UK, I maintained my underground status, you know what I mean? 
I played the big game when I need it. I grabbed the big remixes and big money. I shit, but I gave them 110% sneak classics. Some of these records, some of my best shit was actually remixes that I, I didn't want to even give them out because they were so good. But I was like, damn, I don't have time to make another mix. So I'm going to have to.